Good afternoon, welcome, and thanks for joining us for today's HIS Talk webinar, Jumpstart Your Care Coordination Program, Six Strategies for Delivering Efficient, Effective Care. It's brought to you by HealthWise. I'm Lori from HIS Talk, and I'll be moderating. We have two speakers today. First up will be Jason Burham, who is the Chief Client Officer at HealthWise. Joining Jason will be Jim Rogers. Jim is the Director of Healthcare Solutions for Persistent Systems. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jason. Oh, thank you so much, Lori. Hey, really happy to be here today with everybody on the line. Um, first, we just wanted to give a little bit of introduction to both Jim and I. I'll, I'll start first, share a little bit about HealthWise. Uh, my role here is really to focus on customer success, and we've seen a lot of that over the years. HealthWise is a not-for-profit organization and we're very purpose-driven, focused on helping people make better health decisions. And the way that we've make, made that happen uh, over time and over the past 40-plus years is by working with large uh, integrated delivery networks and health systems and large health plans and really integrating into their enterprise where care happens. And we integrate across care settings, and most importantly, we integrate right into the, the major workflow applications uh, that care teams used to uh, track and chart and deliver care. And I think last but not least, uh, we've been really in the business of, uh, most recently, of helping organizations um, take a look at change. Uh, the healthcare environment, as we know, is uh, chaotic, uh, especially these days, and we've been under some major shifts. And so a lot of our work has been to help facilitate best practices across our clients and to bring consulting knowledge and expertise to help them understand how to implement uh, more modern strategies to help them achieve their goals. Jim? Thanks, Jason. Uh, I've been a registered nurse for 18 years, starting out in, in critical care, sleep medicine, and, and transitioning into healthcare operations for ancillary services, uh, population health management, and, and building out a 24-7 healthcare contact center. Uh, I've built a number of patient journey mapping programs and systems uh, using Salesforce and have recently transitioned to persistent systems where I leverage my experience on, in an oncology navigation and care coordination um, and currently work with top healthcare systems across the country to implement care coordination models on the Salesforce Health Cloud platform. Very good. So with that, we'll kind of kick off the, the intro to our talk today. And uh, we really you know, see this and, and we think that you would agree the culture of care is changing. And from, from our perspective, what we want to posit is the transformation of care delivery uh, in the system really begins with reorienting the process of care delivery from what we call um, fee-for-service approach to more of that uh, fee-for-value or the fundamental goal of keeping patients healthy in the system. And we know that regardless of what happens in the uncertain environment that we have, that that shift for uh, metrics that are more about patient quality and those being the drivers ultimately for reimbursement, but that shift and that trend is going to continue regardless of, uh, of other uncertainties we're working with. So this big cultural shift towards true patient-centered team-based care uh, is well underway. Now, just to shift a little bit, um, um, one thing that always strikes me in the conversations that I, ha I have with our clients is, is just how easy it is, um, the benefit that we have in healthcare, to take a moment and think about why are we here and why are we focused on what we're doing. And one of the biggest reasons is because healthcare is so personal. At one point or another, we're all patients. We're either giving care to those that we love, um, those we care about, or we're patients ourselves. And so it's very easy to find that kind of intrinsic motivation when you're in the healthcare industry and really strive for making things better uh, every, every chance that we can get. And for me, um, I thought I'd start off with just a little bit of a personal story. One of the things, one of the kind of key moments in my life that really made the work that I do every day um, most personal for me is the story of my son, Nick. Nick's on the screen in front of you right now. He is a freshman in high school. He's, by all measures, at least from, you know, a proud dad's perspective, he's very successful. He's A's and B's. He's got his own LLC. He's, do, he's doing app development. I feel like you could look at Nick and say, this is, this is a person with a bright future. Fourteen years ago, 
the picture of Nick was less certain. This is Nick on the screen in front of you. If you <laughs> if you recall um, the craze around Beanie Babies back in the day, that little stuffed animal in the back, and you know Beanie Babies are not very big, that's a Beanie Baby in the back there. Nick was born at 27 weeks, zero days. He was less than two, back, two pounds. He spent 95 days in an incredible NICU with amazing staff. And what I observed as a champion for Nick and as a caregiver uh, for Nick is that the environment to keep Nick on the right track was very complex. There were, it was confusing. The education that I received as a dad trying to do my best was sparse and to zero. And the handoffs between the folks on the care team were inconsistent at best. Um, super well intended. Everybody was striving really hard to do the right thing. You could tell the intentionality was there, the motivation was there to do the right thing for Nick and everyone else around Nick in that situation. But it just felt like the tools were not uh, up to par with the challenge. And so I found that uh, it was really important for me to be there during things like shift changes or during rounds and making sure that I could help interpret in, uh, and, you know, some, some scratches, uh, notes on the chart, I could help interpret those things. If there were tests coming up, I could help make sure they weren't duplicative or at most I could have a good understanding of what the value was. And I felt like I, I played a real critical role in a very complex environment. And I, for me, that was very helpful in helping me understand some opportunities we have to really make some key improvements, especially as care gets even more complex. So I thought a lot about this and, and have observed over the years with our clients these past 14 years and learned some, some really key takeaways. Here's what we've learned. Care coordination is and can be a secret weapon to engaging patients both inside and outside the walls of care. And you just take a look at the problem. Inadequate, inadequate care coordination was responsible for 25 to 45 billion in wasteful spending in 2011. And that's really primarily attributed to avoidable complications and unnecessary uh, readmissions. So we've got this challenge of complexity of care. Uh, you know, let's, let's take a look at our own experiences. We as patients, we interact with numerous physicians, nurses, medical assistants, other clinical professionals across multiple care settings. And really the interesting thing is, is that for the first time in human history, our health is failing due to preventable chronic illness versus infectious diseases. So this challenge of chronic conditions, uh, it costs the U.S. economy more than a trillion annually, near, nearly 6% of the national debt. These are all things that we hear about at every conference we go to, right? Everybody on the line is, is hearing these things. And the number of patients with chronic disease is rising. We hear that as well. And, you know, it makes you wonder, what can we do? Well, we know that the patient um, if, if we say that these are preventable um, illnesses, then we know that the patient is a key opportunity for us to make some positive change. And a lot of it has to do with the changes in their behaviors that we can motivate. We also know that shift to value-based care is well underway, as I said at the, kind of the opening of the talk. 50% of all Medicare payments will be performance-based by 2018. So uh, this shift is not going to change. And I think really these three things, the complexity of care, this shift for the way that uh, healthcare, the challenges that healthcare is taking on like chronic conditions and the shift to um, uh, you know, different reimbursement methods is really the three reasons why care coordination is so important and it's so important right now. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Jim. Jim is an absolute industry expert and a wealth of knowledge uh, about how to implement strategies to effectively coordinate care and with that, Jim, take it away. Thanks, Jason. So the question really is, how effectively does your healthcare organization coordinate care? And what we're looking at today is six strategies uh, to uh, help jumpstart your care coordination program. The first strategy is to make meaningful investments in, in healthcare IT. And uh, we'll jump to a pain point and talk about EHRs. Here's the good. Uh, more than 95% of eligible hospitals have successfully transitioned to EHRs. Uh, here's the bad piece, though. 50% of the health systems and hospitals that noted a lack of standardization um, was one of the top three challenges their organization faces in developing 
and extending the care uh, continuum collaboration. Um, I think the other 50% still think their EHR is the total solution for, for healthcare coordination. Um, while the EHR is a great tool in the acute setting, it's not as useful for care coordination across an entire healthcare system. Having the right technology and infrastructure in place expedites communicating patient data and reduces errors and delays. So what can your healthcare organization do to ensure that it makes these meaningful investments in the healthcare IT infrastructure? First of all, assess your organization's current technology with an eye towards care, co care coordination workflow. Ideally, technology enables the care team to be better integrated, better connected, and more streamlined. Invest in software programs and solutions that work seamlessly with your EHR and eliminate obstacles that slow the care coordination workflow. There's many software programs out there and systems that can integrate data from multiple sources, EHRs, claims data, telephony systems, medical devices, even wearables, into a single platform. And by having all of this information in one place, you can have a 360-degree view of the patient, um, what their relationships are within your healthcare system. Salesforce Health Cloud is one such solution. A great question to ask is where are your care coordinators documenting now? Is it Outlook, Excel, or notebooks on their desk? Second thing is to empower your care team to, uh, uh, with simple, secure communication tools for their interactions. The care team should know what's going on with the patient. Who touched them last? What are their current issues or concerns? What encounter should trigger a notification? And what event should trigger an intervention? The next thing is to create an implementation, implementation strategy and ongoing training for technology systems. Having an implementation roadmap and communicating the value and the benefits of new technology and providing regular training um, allows your team to be successful. Choosing a dynamic platform that can be modified to meet your unique care needs and planning for regular updates to ensure that this application or system is matching your protocols and processes and not the other way around. I'll share an example of the most recent healthcare organization that I was with in Denver, Colorado uh, came on board to create um, a hub of population health, which is a 24-7 contact center. And, and the question was, what does that really mean to be the hub of population health? And, and so the idea was, how could we take patients, whether they were at risk or they had chronic conditions or they just needed to be connected within our healthcare system, and how could we navigate them through our healthcare system and connect them at any point and then, and then keep a record of those those interactions. And so what we did is we took a, a cloud-based phone system with a CTI integration to Salesforce. We created a database of at-risk patients and their chronic conditions, care plans, and unique attributes for those patients. And then we dovetailed that with a, a database of providers and facilities within that healthcare system and their unique attributes. And then we were able to provide services including scheduling, referral management, nurse triage, discharge follow-up and, and patient education all within a single platform regardless of where uh, the patient was coming into our network. Jason? So as we're talking about um, making the patient a key component of this process, uh, it's good to kind of highlight how that might work. So you layer on top of the great examples and the strategies that Jim just shared and you say, great, so how do we make sure that we're creating the opportunity for the patient to engage. Well, these IT workflow applications that we've all invested in, EMRs, are a critical tool. And of course, if you can drive care coordination through your EMR, a lot of organizations say that's something uh, we want to try. The warning that we hear uh, based upon the data that Jim just shared, though, is, is that sometimes the EMR um, really isn't the best place uh, to, for care coordination to happen because sometimes it's a little bit, um, we have challenges with the number of EMRs being used in given organizations. Regardless, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we can educate patient education right into the workflow so that the care team is equipped with the right tools to consistently communicate and engage the patients. So of course, from HealthWise's perspective, integrating into all the leading EMRs is critical. Now, for those organizations that have seen the challenge of equipping their care coordinators with one single 360-degree view of the patient. Um, they've adopted things like Salesforce Health Cloud, and of course, that's a great opportunity for education to be integrated as well. 
And what happens when you integrate with these workflow applications, regardless of, of whether you're asking the EMR to step up to the challenge or you're adopting additional applications like Salesforce Health Cloud, by educating patient ed or integrating patient education, it means your care coordinators have a streamlined workflow. So the patient data, the thing that makes their care delivery more personal, the data filters, it filters the search results, it makes it easy for the care team to provide timely and relevant information. And it's all connected on the back end so your care coordinators have a full view of what the patient does with the education after you send it out. And that is a huge step ahead of what the age-old uh, print-based technologies or even worse, mouth-to-ear technologies that we used to use in the old days. Jim, back to you to kick off strategy number two. Thanks, Jason. So strategy two is, is to stratify your patients and proactively reach out to your high-risk and your at-risk groups. Uh, care for patients with comorbid chronic conditions costs up to seven times as much as care for those with only one chronic condition. There's multiple ways that you can stratify your patients into meaningful categories by identifying cost drivers. Um, this data can come from claims, EHR documentation, or real-time care coordinator inputs. And it should be dynamic so that the patient is always managed at the appropriate level uh, of intervention. Risk stratification helps us to determine our high cost or high risk patients um, that, are, that are in your organization and where you can focus your care coordination resources. Uh, you're looking for patients who are misusing healthcare services or need education about the healthcare system or their chronic disease. And when you're risk stratifying, you want to be sure to identify cost drivers and stratify patients into categories um, that are meaningful to your organization, such as high ED utilizers, uh, those with barriers to care, those with social service needs. And you want to prioritize high-risk and at-risk patients and create appropriate care plans. And, and you can see on the slide there's a number of ways to do that. And in each one of those categories, you would have a different care plan, a different outreach model, um, and, a, and a different way of, of engaging with those patients. I'll share an example of a clinically integrated network in Colorado, and, and they used a very similar model to this. They utilized a tool to risk stratify their patients, um, their at-risk or their ACO population, into five chronic condition buckets, and, and you see those uh, there. It's actually six and uh, five, I'm sorry. And then um, also their high ED utilizers and their high cost patients. And, and the result of that was 4,000 out of 175,000 patients were considered high risk and went into an active care coordination model. So they created these cohorts, uh, created an outreach program, um, assessed specific needs and reached out to each one of these patients individually to determine their actual risk and determine the appropriate interventions, whether that's patient education, access to care, social services, behavioral health, uh, whatever it is that they need. Um, they adjusted that risk level based on their assessments. Now, what happens with the other, the other um, 171,000 patients? Those patients were passively monitored, monitored uh, via notifications of ED visits or admissions and um, gaps in care uh, and educational opportunities. And then as those patients bubbled up into a, a notification or, or an event, then they were assessed and either moved into a higher risk category or, or continued to stay in, in that level. Jason? Great, Jim. Appreciate that. Now, I think that um, a couple of challenges arise in, in some of the examples that we've had um, in some of the, um, the work that we've done with our clients. And one of the challenges is, is it's, uh, once you do some stratification, you have an understanding of those folks that really from a cost justif justification perspective, you can assign staff to go engage with and create the right interventions. But then you have a group of folks that are at lower risk. You know, they're rising risk, but they're at lower risk, and it's, it's very hard to find cost-effective methods to reach out to them. Also, um, with this shift towards bigger care teams, oftentimes, if, you know, put yourself in the patient's shoes. Oftentimes, the number of voices can be confusing, and the message that comes across can be inconsistent. So this is where uh, education and engagement uh, strategies can really come into play. Number one, to reach out to a population outside of your four walls that are harder to reach uh, cost-effectively with staff, you can use uh, population health strategies. And a lot of that relies upon health education to engage folks. 
And some of these triggers in your business can be age or demographic based. So somebody turns 50, there can be some automated messaging that goes out to the population about um, a course of care that they should consider based upon that age. Maybe it's a gender-based uh, trigger. So population health education strategy, driven by education, uh, are really important because it helps patients understand why they need to do a particular um, action. And then, you know, for the piece where the voices can sound inconsistent, the nice thing about having an enterprise source of education is that from the patient's perspective, when that education goes out and whether they're getting that education handed to them by somebody on the care team or whether they're receiving it through a digital and web uh, strategy or outreach campaign, the, the education is coming from one source. It sounds the same. It, it allows your organization and your care team to sound like it has a consistent unified voice for the patient and that really improves engagement. And we're going to shift to strategy three here. And I'm going to take this one, and this, this is really talking about how we're recruiting the patient to be um, the quarterback of their own care team. We'll use a sports analogy, but you can say to be the movie star of their own film. Whatever the case may be, what are the strategies to recruit the patient uh, to take part? Well, and here's one of the challenges we have. We have discussions with folks, with our clients, with physicians, with clinicians, and they say, look, you know, a lot of my patients really aren't interested in doing the research on their own. They would like to hear from me um, what the plan is, and they'll just take my word for it. Okay, that may be the case, and, and chances are there is a sub-segment of population that really, really prefers that. But here's what we see outside in, in the world. We see that one in three American adults go online to figure out a medical condition. We see that 72% of Internet users say they looked online for health information within the past year. And then we pair that with a big challenge. And again, I referred to this earlier as mouth-ear technology. So there's good studies out there that say that patients tend to immediately forget 40 to 80% of the information their care providers present to them. <laughs> if you read further in the study, it says of the information they remember, they were 50% um, of it they remember incorrectly. So they think they remember it, and they're trying to go about uh, doing the best they can for their own health and adhering to the care plan, but they're challenged. And so what we know is that patient education is no longer a nice to have. It's an integral part of how patient care is delivered. And one of the most important elements is delivering consistent health education. And it needs to include a couple of things. So I'm just going to talk about the ingredients here. The content, the education, the intervention tools, they need to be unbiased. They need to be based on evidence and easy for patients to understand. Just as an example, poor, poor health literacy costs between 100 and more than $200 billion a year. So one of the key ingredients is making sure you're partnering with an organization that has staff that's trained to write in a way that people understand, that, are, that where you know, we've used behavior change science to make sure that the educational interventions are going to meet people where they are in the trajectory of their care. We also know that um, we need to offer education that is easy to deliver. So we need to make it easy for the care team. So it's got to integrate into existing workflows. And when we do, when we do address the patients, we need to make sure that we're taking their uh, preferences and values into consideration. And we know that when we do that, we see three to five times more satisfied patients um, because we've taken the opportunity as clinicians and the care team to take their preferences and values into consideration. An another uh, um, a bit of outcomes that we see from this is sur surgery utilization being reduced up to 20% when patients are actively involved in clinical decision making. Okay, hold, up, hold the phone here. Do we actually want to decrease surgery utilization? Okay, I can see how that would be an unattractive statistic. But what we find when we dig deeper is, is that we're really focused on uh, surgery for uh, patients where it's most appropriate because if you're doing right surgery on the right patient, your outcomes afterwards are going to be better. Uh, patients that are more informed and more part of that uh, surgery decision are more likely to follow uh, and adhere to their care plan and the outcomes and the quality measures are going to increase on the other side of that procedure as a result. And we've got some examples. So. One of our clients is University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and they really challenged us. They said, 
look, a pain point for us is that the patient, the education that our patient's receiving is very inconsistent. So they did a scan across their system, and I'm sure that um, if you've taken time to look at this in your, in your own organization, you may, see, may be seeing the same thing. Lots of different sources of education. It can be very inconsistent. It can create a very um, inconsistent voice that you're establishing uh, in your relationship with your patients. And they really wanted to standardize on patient education. So what we did is we provided an enterprise-wide approach. We really took a look at all the different places where education can integrate into workflow, can integrate with where the patient is touching the system or where the system is reaching outside the four walls to engage with their patients. And we tried to find all those opportunities and, and uh, consult with UPMC to pick the right education, right in, um, videos, the right tools, the right interventions uh, to engage patients where they are. And we made it easy for their clinicians to use because we integrated into their workflow. And it's not just integ uh, integrated into the workflow with their EMR, it's also integrated into their care coordination and care management activities as well. And what we saw was improved patient experience has led to higher patient satisfaction and better outcomes because patients feel, again, like the quarterback of their care team. One of the things I love about this uh, quote from our, um, from our colleague, uh, Connie Filer at UPMC, is the last part here where it says, their educational products empower our patients to better manage their own health. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. Jim, back to you. Let's talk about personalized uh, uh, yet consistent patient experience. Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. So uh, strategy four is to build those personalized yet consistent experiences for every patient with standardized care plans. And in order to achieve better outcomes, you must achieve the right balance between standardization and personalization when it comes to uh, coordinating care. Uh, standardizing care increases quality and, de and decreases cost. And, and this means that you need to train your care coordinators uh, to assess patients and apply a standardized care plan template when appropriate. Um, being able to work with your, your CMO, your physician leaders, to establish consistent protocols that will drive better outcomes. Uh, document the needed um, interventions and pre-plan the outreach strategy, and then proactively identify appropriate education at each step um, within your care plan. You also want to develop metrics that track compliance of both the care coordinators and the patients to their care plan goals. And of course, providing education prior to admission uh, or, or a pre-planned pre surgical procedure um, can allow you to assess the patient for educational experience um, and or gaps um, in that education, uh, reduce complications and help prevent readmissions, identify the points of, of the patient experience when and where patient education could really make a difference. And so an example that I have is, is um, many organizations are, are, are jumping into bundle, patient, uh, bundle payments for joint replacement, um, also CCJR. And it's critical to engage patients early in this process in order to assess barriers to care, educational needs, and risk level. Uh, they may be new to a hospital stay, or they may um, have uh, never had anesthesia before. And um, you want to know up front what resources are going to be required post-discharge so that you can plan accordingly. And then post-discharge, you want to transition to ambulatory care at home, um, and there can be multiple steps in that. And, and the chances for a complication or a, a high readmission um, are, are increased and, and, and is much higher um, as this patient moves through that process. You also want to be prepared with a specific outreach plan at regular intervals to assess recovery and intervene as soon as possible in order to uh, ensure a positive outcome. Jason? Thanks, Jim. So what we know also is that <clears throat> This is a real key point um, of integration between what we want the patient journey to be and what we want the care plan to be from a clinical perspective. So we find this all the time. We find that, you know what, it's really a key challenge across a large system to drive consistent care plan approaches for the myriad of different, uh, you know, care delivery challenges um, that, that we see. So <laughs> just, just driving a consistent care plan is hard enough, but then making sure that the patient is going along on that journey, that, I mean, that is, you know, a little bit over the top. So a lot of times 
what our clients are asking us to do is help them with that. And so just as you're trying to establish a clinical journey um, uh, for your clinicians and care team, we're trying to partner to establish that clinical journey for the patient. And what we want to do is take into consideration all the best practice steps that we've learned, that our clients have learned, that you've learned along the way that lead to the best quality outcome. And really what, we're belie what we believe here is that for almost every step that's on a care plan from a clinician's perspective, there's an opportunity um, in that same step on the care plan where the patient would benefit from being more educated. Oftentimes the task on the plan is, uh, the patient is, is up to the patient to own. So why not educate them and, and equip them? But these, these, this mapping between the care plan events and the patient education is a really, really important task. Jim, back to you. Thanks, Jason. And, and so the, the fifth strategy is to manage care transitions. And we talked a little bit about this in, in the joint replacement example. Um, but nearly one in five Medicare patients is discharged from a hospital um, are readmitted within 30 days. It's 2.6 million seniors at a cost of $26 billion per year. That's why uh, Medicare is paying for uh, transition care management or TCM codes. And better management of care transition includes uh, strengthening communication during transitions um, between clinicians, care coordinators, the patient, and the family. Um, sharing information between settings and automating that information exchange uh, process within your EHR. And this includes notification of admission, scheduled handoffs between care settings, and appropriate assessments of the patient's risk level. And educating patients and caregivers and equipping them with the tools to manage their own care is, is incredibly important. 81% of patients were more satisfied at the time of discharge um, because they received instructions about their care. And we know that highly activated patients reduce readmissions. Patients who are less activated are twice as likely uh, to have a 30-day readmission. And by providing your patients with health education at discharge, you not only improve the patient experience, but you also reduce the chance of, in, of readmissions. And they'll have the information that they need um, to know if they, so, that, so that they can care for themselves and know whether they need to come back or, or, or seek appropriate medical care or not. And, and HealthWise is, is a great example of providing this high quality discharge information that, can use, that you can use. And I'll share a, a quick story about um, my mom. She was relatively healthy and um, though she did have a history of heart palpitations. Um, she bragged up until um, this, this recent episode that she had not been in the hospital since I was born. And um, she was feeling short of breath uh, while climbing some stairs and she reached out to a primary care physician um, who wasn't available but she did meet with a nurse, nurse practitioner and that nurse practitioner um, immediately took her to the adjacent emergency department. And she was admitted with AFib and ended up with a five-day ICU stay and a diagnosis of early stage congestive heart failure. Now, um, she's part of a, a, um, an organization that does active care coordination. And that ED visit triggered a notification to the care coordinator um, who was supporting her primary care physician's office. Um, and that uh, care coordinator made an immediate call to her and she was still in the ICU. Um, the care coordinator visited her in the hospital and coordinated with her primary care physician for a follow-up visit two days post-discharge um, and met with, the, with uh, my mom and the primary care physician and they implemented the, the standardized um, CHF care plan that included regular outreach, uh, remote monitoring, and, and standing orders for uh, pharmacologic intervention if necessary. Um, she received education about her disease and, and her diet and lifestyle changes that she needed to make so that she could manage her ongoing CHF going forward and, and the, the uh, response from my mom was that it, that it was amazing that somebody was already reaching out to her and wanting to care for her in her, set, in her home setting uh, before she ever left the hospital. Back to you, Jason. Thanks, Jim. So we know that we learned a long time ago that integrating patient education into the workflow is critical. Because if it's not accessible when someone on the care team is charting with their patient, then it's simply just not going to happen. It's too hard. It's too hard to leave the workflow, go out and find a resource. Now we know what's even more exciting, what's even better, 
is a much smarter strategy to education is being very deliberate. Let's pick these opportunities like care transitions where we know education can be a secret weapon. And then let's deliberately decide that we're going to reach out proactively. This is where the education is jumping to the forefront. It's not waiting for a clinician to need to activate it. It's jumping to the forefront. It's taking advantage of data in the system. It's taking advantage of a trigger and it's reaching out to make a proactive impact that's very, very hard to do when it doesn't exist at all. And a great example is, is where we were working with a strategic uh, health system who's trying to roll out a strategy for really fundamentally improving um, appropriate readmissions around heart failure. One of the things we know that communication in that discharge process is very critical. Does the patient understand that it's important for them um, to, you know, check in with their primary care um, or other clinician after their discharge. And if, the, if that doesn't happen, is there somebody at the system reaching out to them to find out why? Also, just as important, does the patient understand that there are key things to watch out for? If you're seeing some weight gain, if you're seeing some other red flags and the education doesn't call them red flags to create alarm, but it says, hey, look out for your weight increases, then that's the time to reach back out to your care team. So you can do this programmatically. We know what the evidence says we should do, and we know that uh, patients are, are struggling during these big transitions because it's overwhelming. So this is an example of one way to roll out some education uh, based on some time trigger triggers uh, after discharge from heart failure. These time triggers can change based upon the way that our, organ our clients uh, want to roll these out. This is just one example. Ultimately, we know that this is the way that you can take education and turn it into a real strategic advantage for the way you engage your patients and, uh, and attack some of the quality and the uh, efficiency goals that you're after. Strategy six, let's roll this all together. Jim, back to you. Thanks, Jason. So strategy six is to start with a chronic care management program. So despite new CMS payments to physician practices for select um, chronic care management or CCM services, almost half of healthcare organizations lack a formal chronic care management program uh, and they're leaving possible dollars on the table. So to have an effective chronic care management program, uh, you need to first ensure that your EHR um, system certification and capabilities meets the, the standard that Medicare has set. Um, the second thing is to identify your patients that have chronic conditions or multiple chronic conditions. Um, invite to participate is up there, but actually changed um, January 1, um, that you don't have to have the patients buy in in order to um, enroll them in a chronic care management program. Um, you do want to create and implement care plans, um, inc including documented outreach at appropriate care levels, and create standing order sets um, with your primary care physician and also provide 24-7 um, support and resources for the patient. And, and most importantly, communicate. Create those channels of communication, whether it's notifications, whether it's triggers for uh, interventions, whether it's outreach to the patient and patient education. Um, create those communication channels. And I'll share a, an example of a large healthcare system in Colorado um, who wanted to create a high-performing clinical network of providers and facilities and start managing uh, defined populations beginning with Medicare uh, Shared Savings Program. And, and this, this group started in 2014 and um, they started with a, a dedicated ambulatory uh, care coordination program by following uh, these next steps. And, and the first thing they did was they defined this population to be managed. And, and that was with the, initially the Medicare Shared Savings, um, and they added some other ones, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then they risk stratified that population. Uh, they created specific cohorts of patients that they would actively care coordinate. Um, they created care plans, outreach plans, standing order sets based on best practice um, and approved by the primary care provider. Um, and then they, they engaged these patients via phone, email, and then face-to-face -face visits with the primary care physician. They educated the patients about their chronic conditions and, uh, more importantly, about the healthcare system and what resources were available and how to engage in those resources. They implemented ADT feeds for notification um, and intervention protocols 
um, for both active care coordination and passive care coordination patients. And they utilized a 24-7 uh, nurse, nurse triage and scheduling program uh, for support after hours. And so here's some results. After implementing these strategies, um, the results have actually been very impressive. Um, in addition to Medicare shared savings, they now have five commercial ACOs and two employer ACOs with Secure Horizons full global risk uh, coming on board in 2017. And the, the commercial results, um, zero readmissions for one population, 3.2% for another. Uh, one of the payers uh, was quoted as saying that they've never seen a readmission rate this low in any of their ACOs across the country. Uh, they're also able to lower the, the total cost of care uh, for four of the commercial ACOs. And um, one of those is brand new and they don't have results yet. Uh, they were also um, able to reduce emergency um, room visits for all of these ACOs. Um, and let's jump to some Medicare results. Uh, one of the cohorts that they were managing um, had 50 ED utilizers that over, had over 270 ED visits in the previous six months before being put into the active care coordination program. Um, some of these ED visits were for medication refills, uh, physicals, even dental floss stuck in their teeth. And obviously there was a huge need for patient education here. Um, over the next six months, in active care coordination with standardized care plans and an outreach model, uh, these patients had a combined 40 ED visits. So needless to say, um, they've been very successful and, and continue to see increasing shared savings and, and better outcomes for their patients. Back to you, Jason. Thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks to you um, online who are hanging in there with us. This is a, a weighty subject and it takes some time to get through it and hear some of the real world examples. I think just to kind of summarize here, uh, we're at the end before we switch into some question and answer, is um, just a little recap. So we're in an uncertain time. I think it's easy for us to identify that. We're wondering how some of the changes going on in our country are going to affect our industry, the course of our own businesses. Um, here's the thing that I think both Jim and I agree that we can count on. This shift for, to fee-for-value is going to happen, regardless of uh, other macro changes. And efficient, effective care coordination is really proven to be one of the most important things we can do to be successful in a new landscape. So we've got this first step of taking care of those individuals that are most at risk and driving out the most cost. Also though, you've got, you've got to develop strategies for managing the patient, those patients along with strategies for engaging the entire population. Super, super important. And fundamentally, we know that a key of this, uh, uh, this kind of underpinning this whole thing uh, of delivering good care is that we have to recruit the patient to be a star player on their own care team. We know that we're going to see some, that we've already seen some good results, and that's going to, um, number one is improving the health of patients and increasing their satisfaction. We've seen those results. We've seen results where it's going to reduce hospitalizations, lower the number of ER visits, minimize unnecessary repetitive tests. Ultimately, the value of care coordination is the ability to allow the care team to leverage resources uh, that are available to them, that we make available to them to lower costs increase satisfaction, and improve outcomes for the whole population. And with that, we want to switch into question and answer, and uh, happy to take all questions. Thanks, Jason. Uh, to the attendees, like he said, we'd like to open it up to you for questions. And as a reminder, please use the questions section in the GoToWebinar panel to submit them. The first question, um, Lori would like to know, for the organizations that begin billing the CCM CPT code, how did they handle the copays? Jim, does that sound like a good question for you? Yes, how did they handle the copays? I'm, I'm not sure um, exactly what that question means. So the, the CCM codes um, that they're billing are, are reimbursement from Medicare for providing those uh, services. There would be a, a copay associated with that. Okay, uh, Julie would like to know, are there any numbers on return on investment, meaning how much spent on staff and systems and what bonus payments they realized? Jim, another good question for you. 
Sure. Um, I don't know if you wanted to um, address that from the health education standpoint, and then I can talk about the, the broader care coordination. You know, from a health education standpoint, um, I think it's, it's hard to track education back to uh, one of the triple aim outcomes. What we're finding is that it, one of the key measures is more of an intermediate outcome, and that is whether or not we're actually activating and engaging patients. So we've done some uh, randomized control trials with populations that are managing chronic conditions, um, and we reached out to them with web-based programs that are tailored uh, uh, to support their condition. And so that was our uh, study group, and the, and the control group had access to, to just normal education um, in the form of an online health library available to them. And what we saw between the two populations is those that we reached out with web-based uh, chronic care management um, education and programs, we were able to see a 30% increase in activation uh, when using a, um, a pretty high quality measurement tool in the pre and post uh, between those two different populations. So more of an intermediate outcome, um, but I think, uh, you know, if you combine that with other studies that show that patients tend to choose less aggressive therapies when they've got more education and they're more informed about what their options are, um, I, think you could, I think it's easy for us to say that uh, what we know to be intrinsically true, that health education helps, it can also help the bottom line. Thanks, Jason. And, and in um, overall care coordination models, um, I've seen within, within a number of organizations um, ROI of, of anywhere from uh, 2 to 1 to 4 to 1 from the investment um, in that uh, care coordination model uh, to the um, shared savings uh, along with the, the downstream revenue of, of keeping that patient within the network. So um, we've seen some pretty significant ROI. Uh, some of the challenges, though, is that it does vary by payer, and, and you could have one patient that could completely um, tank any shared savings, or you could have a, a provider who might be um, providing services at, at say, a, um, a long-term acute care facility and billing under its PCP um, tax ID um, and, and end up eliminating any savings at all. So those are some of the challenges with that. But there's definitely a, a pretty significant ROI for implementing care coordination. Is there any research available that indicates how many patients an individual case manager can manage without lowering quality? I'm sure there is. Um, most of what we've seen is um, active care coordination in a range of um, 250 to 500 patients, um, and then and then passive care coordination in the into the thousands. But most of that is is automated, um, and and that seems to be a, a pretty fair. Um, caseload for, for a care coordinator who's doing that full time. Mary Beth would like to know who would comprise the team dedicated to implementing a care coordination program, not just clinicians and IT, but what other roles are crucial? So certainly uh, nurses who would be um, actually performing the care coordination activities and um, a, a key contact within your, your primary care offices that, that you can coordinate um, with to, to get um, advanced access to um, services. For example, um, Health Care Organization in Colorado had a TUC program um, where they had patients who had, had a significantly higher likelihood of having an emergency department visit on the weekend. So they would tuck those patients in on Friday morning, make sure that they had any, any, all of their meds, um, make sure that they were feeling okay and didn't have any issues or concerns. And if they did, they had an immediate contact to get them in for a same-day primary care visit. Um, and, and certainly you would want to add um, a behavioral health component because um, that, that often complicates uh, chronic care management. And then um, social services um, would be involved in that. So a social worker or, or somebody who could address those types of barriers to care. And then, and then finally, really to be um, effective, there has to be 24-7 patient access to um, those who would be managing their care. And, and so typically that's, that's done through a, 
a contact center that has both a, a non-clinical component like a, a resource specialist or someone who's scheduling or, or connecting patients with providers um, and an actual nurse who could triage that patient, but triage in context for uh, not just the symptoms they're presenting with, but their, their actual care plan and any standing order sets or interventions that might be appropriate. And I think just to follow on to that, uh, Jim, just when you segue away from the staff inside an organization who's going to actually own the care coordination, and then you start thinking about the vendors or the industry partners that you might want to tap into in some of those roles, I think that's where, um, where I can speak with more expertise. But uh, from our perspective, um, the, the types of staff that we make available to our clients um, as, a, as a vendor partner helping them implement that is... We certainly have technology folks that talk about how to integrate uh, some of the clinical um, decision support tools into their workflow applications, and that can vary based upon the types of applications you're choosing. We also uh, end up helping clients determine which workflow applications uh, that we've seen uh, have most success across our, cl our client base, and so sometimes we even help with that. Certainly we help with training. Um, and there's a couple of key types of training um, that really are in the kind of patient engagement realm. One is around um, training clinicians how to listen for and support good shared decision-making conversations. So we help out with uh, both virtual and in-person training there so that when those um, patients that they're targeting from a risk stratification perspective are facing some of those big, costly, um, um, you know, healthcare decisions, that the, the clinical team has the tools they need to really um, ask for and record those uh, values and preferences the patients have that, that we know lead to better outcomes. Another key area is, is Jim talked about uh, uh, behavioral health. And, you know, I think of that really along the lines of those social determinants of health. And, and sometimes that can get real practical, like do you have a ride? Um, do you have, uh, um, you know, the right resources at home and people that can help you? The other side of that is health behavior change. So not behavioral health, but health behavior change. And um, another type of training is helping clinicians, whether it's uh, taking advantage of strategies like motivational interviewing and active listening. So helping those, um, those folks um, you know, who are actually managing the care coordination have the uh, better tools and resources for engaging with their patients to tease out what really is going to help them um, adhere to their care plan. And a lot of that has to do with, it's all based in science, but a lot of it has to do with the art of practicing it over and over again. And certainly that's uh, some of the training um, uh, that we see our clients use and make really make their programs more successful. Crystal would like to know if phone-based care coordination can be effective or if you feel like it has to include face-to-face -face time So the, the organizations that I've worked with, the vast majority of the care coordination is, is done over the phone. Um, and, and it can be very effective, especially for um, a senior population where, where typically that's, that may be the only way that you're going to reach them. Face-to-face um, -face can, can be very time consuming. Um, the, the organization that I worked with in Colorado, um, all of their care coordinators uh, worked from home. Uh, and they supported multiple clinics, and, and they did have times where they went in and met with a patient, usually just on an initial visit, um, and maybe that's with the primary care physician to develop that initial care plan. But um, the, the phone care coordination and is incredibly effective, and, and the response back from the patients is that they're, they're waiting for that phone call. They know when it comes, you know, each, each you know, Wednesday, one day a week, or, or um, the second Tuesday of the month, and, and they really look forward to having that conversation and connecting with that care coordinator. And then I, I would just add an, an actual, uh, another modality. So we, we've spoken about phone and face-to-face. -face. Um, I think that, you know, if you look at it from a um, cost-effective perspective, certainly face-to-face -face is more costly, yet it can, it, it can produce good results, maybe because it has a tendency to feel more personal. As Jim just mentioned, phone-based care coordination can be extremely effective. Um, I think another modality is digital and web engagement. So there is an opportunity where um, you, the patient may not be hearing somebody's voice, but they may be seeing something show up 
um, in one of their communication channels that they're from, that they're most comfortable with that they know is coming from a good place. They know it's coming from a, a group of people who they've spoken with in the past and that even though um, they're not hearing that person on the phone, they're receiving this message and it looks consistent with what the, the, you know, the care plan that they've spoken to their care coordinator about. And so it's these more automated reminders, automated messaging that can happen that's driven from the care plan and connected as a source back to the care team, yet is, is um, uh, a little more scalable than even phone-based. Okay, we're just about at the end of our time, but I'm going to ask one more question. Um, you don't always get the adequate staffing you need to manage target populations, so what strategies would you suggest? So is that to do care coordination on a budget? Um, I, I would certainly start with the, the high risk and, and highest cost um, patients. You know, probably 10% of your patients are, are going to drive um, 70 or 80% of your cost. And, and so um, certainly starting with those um, and, and um, trying to automate as much as possible the, those, those interactions and standardizing the care plans and the assessment pieces and being able to send those out um, and automate those would, would certainly um, help with the, the staffing ratios. Okay, um, that was our last question. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and thank you Jim and Jason for the interesting and informative presentation. As a reminder to attendees, watch your email for links to the recording of today's webinar as well as the PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. We look forward to seeing you at our next HIS Talk webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day.